I am really, really pleased to introduce our guest today. But before I do, this is Slow Food Live. My name is Giselle. If you're not familiar with Slow Food, Slow Food is an international grassroots movement that began in Italy 30 years ago. Our mission is good, clean, and fair food for all, which of course encompasses many, many layers and dynamics and people and industries and practices and choices. So Slow Food Live is our way of bringing Slow Food into your home so that you can lean into those choices and that lifestyle in your own life. We're glad you're here. I'm going to reintroduce Kala Stoll, who's with us again after an awesome session called Slow Fish 101. If you didn't get a chance to watch that, I encourage you to do so. We talked a lot about what to look for in fish, how to source locally, and sort of what's important and what's part of the slow fish value system. And Kala ran us through that, which was great. And now we're here to kind of work with a fish after you learned how to source it. And we have Call us a friend of Collis, a friend of Slow Fish, a friend of Slow Food, Chef Evan Mallet, coming from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, in the Black Trumpet Bistro. I'm going to let Evan tell you more about himself, but I will say that we are really happy to have you here today and grateful for your time. So I will just hand this over to you, Evan, and you can let us know where you're coming from and show us where you're at. Thank you so much, Giselle. Hello, everybody. Hi, Collis, and thank you guys for putting this together. I'm standing in front of my restaurant like a reporter right now, um, just so you guys can see that uh, here in downtown Portsmouth, New Hampshire, we um, are very fortunate to be situated directly across the street from the Piscataqua River. And um, the, uh, it's a, the second fastest flowing tidal river in the United States and a very busy port, so still an active port. Um, now I'm doing a 360, but I wanted to show you guys our mascot. This is a fish uh, that was painted by a man named Zura Bushurishvili in Soho. Um, he's upside down right now, representing the state of the world. And now we go back down the stairs. This is the fastest tour ever of my restaurant because our dining room here behind me has just been converted for the last few weeks for takeout, which we're doing Wednesday through Sunday. And we also prepare our meal kits here that people can assemble at home. And that's two of our solutions to survival during this time. Here's our handsome car decal. Let me see the lighting there. So yes, those go on the sides of our cars. We do delivery to home as well. And one of our greatest resources, the gentleman behind the mask, Spencer Montgomery, former commercial fisherman and now sommelier at Black Trumpet. So, his journey has been one through uh, helping work with our fishery, involved in the fisheries himself, and uh, now selling fish table side at Black Trumpet, or in this case, curbside. So you're now in the kitchen, uh, the very humble, I might add, kitchen of Black Trumpet, and that's Melissa over there. Hi, Melissa. And we're gonna be doing a little jogging of the screen here, so please, uh, you know, say in the chat box or chime in if you feel like you're not getting a clear image of what I'm doing on the bench and I'll try to make adjustments there. This is a technology with which I'm not very experienced. But um, anyway, we have our fish to my left here and I'm gonna put some gloves on and be back in two seconds. So one of the things that we're hoping to do, I mean, first of all, I'll just say that Evan and I go back to 2005, a couple of months after Hurricane Katrina, where he and dear friend Mark Siegel and several other chefs in the Seacoast worked to do a benefit dinner on that. And so that's kind of how I got plugged into the chef's community and sort of been, been involved with it since then. And some of the you know, best people that I know in terms of giving back to the community, and that's what, um, what Evan's been doing. So what we're hoping is to sort of allay any fears that people have with handling whole fish. So Evan, all you. All right, so over here, uh, we've got some beautiful fish from the Gulf of Maine. Uh, we work at Black Trumpet and have always worked with as many local boats as possible. Um, call us, you can probably quote the sad statistics uh, pre-COVID-19 in terms of the number of boats in the New Hampshire fleet right now of commercial fishermen. Um, it is a very small number and getting smaller, it seems, um, 
you know, every, every passing year. So uh, one of the boats that I have worked with is the one that Spencer uh, was a fisherman on, um, and that is the Finlander. Uh, today, we did not get uh, fish directly from the Finlander because it's a smaller boat in the very rocky waters and high winds uh, the last couple of days. They have not been able uh, to go out. So um, we do have Gulf of Maine fish and three species that we're going to be playing with today are Haddock, which uh, is one of our great success stories of sustainability. And Haddock is, this is a sort of medium sized Haddock. Um, relatively easy to work with. The flesh is very tender, um, flaky, fragile, and delicious. A lot of people love Haddock. That's my parents' favorite fish. And then we have Acadian redfish, not to be confused with the Gulf of uh, Mexico redfish, which is actually in the drum family. <clears throat> this one is uh, a beautiful, sometimes marketed as ocean perch. There are a lot of other uh, words that are used to describe it, but with the uh, scale still on, it's this really vibrant tropical coral pink color and a delicious fish. So we're going to do a couple things with that today. And then finally we have Pollock, which you can see it might be easier to move the screen than to move all the fish, but um, Pollock is one of the more abundant fish in the Gulf of Maine and therefore uh, one of the keys to the uh, sustainability of our fisheries. And then let's see, we're going to go over here to my knife bag and grab a couple of knives. I was going to show you what a fillet knife or boning knife looks like. Um, once you get the muscle memory and feel comfortable with the mechanics of fish butchery, you can do pretty much anything. Although I wouldn't recommend this, but pretty much anything else would, would work. For a knife. And we're going to start with scaling, right? So a lot of the fishermen um, who bring us fish are gonna bring us scaled and gutted fish. That happens on the boat. Um, but it's not always convenient for them to do that. So we will also sometimes get fish that isn't scaled and gutted. This is something that uh, when we talk about the, the new order during uh, this time of quarantine, people in order to be working with local fish are sometimes going to have to work with what's less convenient. If the fishing uh, boats can get that product directly to people's homes through home delivery, um, or shipment or any other, any other way. Um, there's obvious reasons why we want to, to gut the fish, but it's not that hard to scale. It's really sloppy and messy. And so I think a lot of professional kitchens don't want to deal with that and certainly home cooks don't either. But I'm going to demonstrate a couple of techniques. So we have these deep veg sinks and we put the fish down in them and we will scale the, uh, the fish there. Let me just find my scaler. Whoops, I put it down. Ah, thank you. <coughs> Melissa, she's like the extra hands I don't have. Um, thank you. So we have this compostable um, trash bag here. And with a fish like redfish, when you go to scale it, and it's, it's not gutted yet, but I like to leave it whole like this for scaling. And then it tends to slip out of my hand, so I'm going to use a piece of toweling or napkin or whatever you have at home for a side towel to hold on to the tail and then sort of wrap it inside the bag that's in this bowl. You can also do this in a sink. Are you guys able to see that? Yes. Evan, can you show us the scale, scaler up close so people can take a look? There's, there's the tool, but I will say these are sometimes hard to find if you don't have like a specialty kitchen supply store near you. Um, this one's actually a piece of crap also, and the handle keeps falling off. I'm quite certain it's going to do that during this demonstration. Um, but it doesn't really matter if it loses the handle. You can still use the scaler part of it. This is called a French scaler. Um, but we will also show you that you don't have to use a scaler. You can use the back of the knife. That's what I've used, yeah. Yeah, so the knife works, but it tends to send it flying, whereas the design of the French scaler uh, subdues the tra trajectory, if that uh, makes sense. Maybe subdues isn't the right word. Um, but so I'm sort of scraping down the outside of the fish right now. 
and then I'll flip it over. And scales, they're like the most adhesive natural food ingredient and that, you, that you can have. It's like the same collagen in scales that makes a really good fish stock gelatinous. It's that very gluey adhesive quality. So now we have a scaled fish. And one of my favorite uses for uh, redfish is actually to prepare it whole. It's really important that we, I get to use one of my favorite uh, anatomical words here. We get to go in the cloaca. So that's the little, um, well, the obvious uh, place of refuse in the fish that uh, go in. And you want to be careful not to like puncture everything. I say that to people and then the next thing we do is we go in and kind of tear stuff up. So after this, what's really important, oh, and we have such good news. This is amazing. Look at that. So at this time of year, we often find roe. Look at that beautiful roe sack. I mean, it depends on your definition of beauty. I, I give you that, but I'm going to put that right on our cutting board and we'll play with that. This time of year, you see with redfish in particular, lots of delicious roe. And you can pack that in salt or salt and a little bit of sugar and cure it and then actually grate it like right on the side of a um, uh, cheese grater. Or you can use a zester or any other uh, grating device and shave it. So I don't have running water right next to me. So call us if you want to uh, talk to people maybe about anything I've talked about so far, we can field a couple of questions while I go rinse out the orifice left from ripping the guts out. Sure. Um, first off, all of these species are ground fish, New England ground fish, and they can be in 100 feet of water, they can be in 400 feet of water. Um, and so that's why the size of the eyes of these fish are so big because they're taking in what little light is down there uh, at the bottom. When I, I went out with Tim, uh, Captain Tim Ryder of New England Fishmongers a couple of years ago, we were jig fishing. You're down, um, you know, you're down 300 feet or so. Um, so it can take, take a while to do that. And, um, Are you talking about the, the eyes bugging out on a redfish? No, I was talking, just talking about the size of the eyes for, oh, yeah. for being down at that depth for, you know, receiving what life. I mean, you they also do, they do a pretty good Marty Feldman impression when they come up out of the water and they, the eyes like stick right out. Ladies uh, and gentlemen, Evan Mallet right there. <laughs> all right. So um, one of the things about redfish uh, that people don't like dealing with, and again, this is a very abundant fish, so we need to be working with it. We need to be eating it. Um, we have these great things. One of my favorite kitchen tools, believe it or not, is Joyce Chen scissors. They cut through anything, including fingertips, so you do have to be careful using them. Um, but redfish are super spiny. And if you ever worked with um, dogfish, similar thing, where if you go and do a little preventive uh, grooming, I guess, for lack of a better word, you can trim up these fins. Is that visible, how I'm doing that? Yep. You sort of go against the grain. So if you trim up those fins, you're going to prevent stabbing yourself during the preparation of the fish and you're also going to prevent if you prepare the fish whole uh, people from uh, stabbing themselves during the eating of the fish. All right so when we get those fins and we set those aside I will use those fins in a stock. We all know about shark fin soup and how that's a controversy in and of itself but um, Fins do have that collagen I was referring to that are so flavorful in uh, getting that uh, texture in a fish stock. All right, so I'm gonna, you don't wanna look at me anymore. You wanna see the fish. So here I'm taking my, my knife and I'm going to start with an incision. And uh, redfish is a little tricky because behind uh, the bones of, of the head, there's like this little uh, extra collar that's spiky. It kind of fans out like that. So you want to make sure your knife goes down behind that collar. And I, I think this is also really important to say that this doesn't have to be perfect right out of the gates. When people take on fish butchery, you want to be safe. 
Um, you want to be careful with your, your knife if you don't feel like you have confident knife skills. Uh, but you don't have to get everything off of it. And we'll talk about what happens if you don't. Um, but I think like people first time filleting fish are really concerned that they're going to screw up by missing a piece. And if you're a fishmonger and you're the cutter on the floor, then yes, you'll get fired if you do that. But we're not going to get fired at home working with Acadian redfish um, and trying to fillet. So hey, Evan, before you go, can you show us, just tip us up and show us the, the cut that you've just made so we can yeah. see. So right, right behind the head here. Yeah. And I go all the way. Uh, from the, the belly right to the spine. Yep. And um, I'm not sure if we're using technical uh, language here, but belly and spine, sort of where you would think they are. And then the knife is actually going to now go along this side of the spine, roughly parallel to the cutting board. And one of the tricks about breaking down a whole fish is that I see people sometimes like working way out, leaning over the board, and you can't really get the knife flat to the surface, especially if it's a flat fish, uh, if you're working with skate or flounder, sole, any other flat fish. Um, what you wanna do to give yourself an advantage is to move the fish to the edge of the board closest to you. Okay, so I'm standing here, and now I have right along the edge of the board, plenty of room for my knife to move around, okay? Mm -hmm. so. With fish uh, butchery, when I was first taught, I was taught by a chef that the knife has to always go in the direction from head to tail. Um, I long ago uh, aborted that, that plan, and I think when the fish is on the right side uh, that you're working with, that makes sense, but it doesn't always uh, add up. I should also mention I'm a lefty, so do everything I'm doing backwards. <laughs> All right. So then the knife, and again, this is not a super, super sharp knife. It is a law in the kitchen that sharp knives cause fewer accidents than dull ones. Um, but I guess I didn't want to have to have like a razor sharp knife to give me an advantage over anyone else. So I've made this incision now, okay, where I'm right on the upside of the vertebrae. And when I get to the vertebrae, there's kind of like this little ridge, repre it represents the length of the fish right down the middle. Um, there's that medial line and we can do a couple of things when we get there. You want to sort of let the knife go up and then back down on the other side and this is where I make the decision, am I going to cut through the ribs right here and take a full fillet that I then have to go back over and remove the bones either by pin boning or by cutting them out and my answer is right now, I'm going to show you a J cut, which basically I follow the line of the ribs up. So right here on the belly, I'm following those ribs right up. And you can see I left a little piece of fish here that was just sloppy. Um, but like I said, it's not going to be the end of the world. And now I'm cutting down, following the contour of those ribs as they go down toward the belly. So note that what I did here is create something I don't have to go back over. That's just a straight fillet that has no bones right here uh, because I followed them up from the spine. And what it also leaves me with is this whole uh, belly flap right here. On larger fish, that meat is totally delicious. On really large fish, there's a you know, plenty of theories, not just theories, but scientifically valid observations that uh, some PCBs, mercury, and other uh, heavy metals can be stored in that flesh in particular. Um, we could talk about Escalar and other fish where that's more common. But right now we're talking about very healthy, delicious, lean Gulf of Maine fish. And uh, I'm not too concerned with those um, pollutants in the, in the flesh of most of these fish. So as everyone see, the, that's the scaled skin, which I'm going to leave on uh, for this fish. Um, but I should actually say one thing about that. Redfish, for those of you who are listening in from the Northeast, um, like some other species around the world, uh, has this pretty rubbery skin. And in preparation of it, you can either remove the skin of the redfish, but it also gives the fillet integrity. So when you go to sear this, two things happen. Um, it has a tendency to curl quite a bit. 
So in order to deal with the curling, I take the knife and I slash through the skin just enough without going all the way through the fish. And you can see like what that looks like. Some of those were a little deeper than I wanted them to be, but that, that way when you season and sear this side uh, to get that nice crispy skin, you, it's gonna prevent it from buckling and curling the filet like that. Okay, and then we have the second side of the fish, which is often, I think, more difficult. Uh, the first side can come off a little bit more easy uh, because you don't have that other half of the fish to sort of hold it up. So I'm gonna go in again on this side underneath that little uh, triceratops plate there. That's what I was trying to think of before. The childhood dinosaur fascination finally paid off. And then I'm gonna draw that line right down the middle on the board. Raise your right arm just a little bit so we can see more. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I just did the same thing I did on the first side. And then I get to that me medial bone right there. And Another thing, as you see the fish sliding around a little, a lighter weight fish, um, there's nothing wrong with setting a towel down underneath it and helping um, keep the fish from sliding around. Um, I do that all the time. So again, uh, now we're left with a, uh, you know, the, the bones or the rack, as it's often called, the racks of the fish, um, with all of this little meat that's still here where I either screwed up or um, just to, chose not to cut that part off. On a bigger fish, and maybe we could show you this, it's, there's nothing quite like cod or halibut, but there is um, in the head a cheek muscle, we call it, which can be harvested from the head. I don't have any fish big enough today to do that, um, but you can look right, basically right behind the eye, you can feel a soft uh, part of where, where there's no bone and you can carve that right out usually about the same size as the eyeball of the fish and um, super tender, delicious, kind of like scallops in some fish. And, uh, but without that, without harvesting the cheek, what I'm gonna be thinking about harvesting from what is left of the carcass here um, is any meat that I can scrape off, which is great to add into fish cakes. Um, depending on the kind of fish, sometimes you can put that into ceviche, ceviche as well. Um, and you don't need any fancy tools for that. In fact, I'm just gonna grab a spoon and show you guys. With salmon, this like, it just comes flying off the bone. But you can see how much, like just by raking across in, that, in those few seconds, I've got this tablespoon of flesh and you can go all the way over both sides with that. And that again is usable for all sorts of, um, you know, you could, you could make fish meatballs out of it, um, fish pate, lots of uh, more, you know, advanced culinary things that aren't as advanced as we'd like to think they are. <clears throat> so then I also have the, the belly to harvest. And on this particular fish, it's not gonna be a ton of meat, um, but I just wanna show what one of those looks like. So on each side, there's gonna be a flap like that. It's perfectly edible, but often, sort of uh, less desirable because it's not plump and juicy. And um, that can also be you know, ground up and used in many of the things that I mentioned for this other meat as well. Um, the collar, and I think we'll actually do a pollock now so I can show you maybe a little bit better example of the collar. So meanwhile, I'll put these fillets on ice with the other fish. When I store these, I usually put uh, skin side on the outside. And that's so no scales get, you know, touching the, the usable part of the fish. Hey, Evan, quick stop here. Yeah. Um, we sure. did have a, you know, follow up question on using the roe. Um, I mean, can you use roe out of a, a red fish? The way I would do it would be season it and just saute it, you know, but 
Can you? Uh, yeah, so like, I mean, there's an old New England tradition um, for shad row that uses that, uh, that idea. And you can absolutely do that with any fish. Honestly, like the salting of the row that's, that's maybe more trendy, um, which comes from a very old tradition in Europe, uh, Botarga in Italy and Sardinia uh, is smelt row and can be tuna row as well. So there are lots of uh, ways to cure it. And that's sort of the, I think the, the more common use now in, in restaurants, but by all means, if you have enough of these uh, harvested, and you can see some of the eggs are now coming out because I just punctured it a little bit with my finger. Um, and that, that's also a really key thing is to try to keep that intact if you're going to do the technique that you're talking about calls. Right. Um, but it's super delicious, cooked just fresh and lightly seasoned, much less fishy in fact. But this is as good a place as any for me to mention that I don't use the word fishy, um, <laughs> nor do I use the word gamey because they take uh, the, what should be praise and they turn it into a pejorative term. And I feel like uh, fish, fishy should be a compliment to the fish, but we tend to use it as an insult. Um, so I, I try not to say fishy, even though I just did. Did I answer your question, Carlos? Yeah, yeah, no, that was fine. It was one, a question that we, we got, and I, I wanted it to sort of like explore, because that's, that's what, I mean, my dad did the Shad Row thing, um, and he brought that into our household, so. Yep. It was, it was. Yeah, and okay. shad's, shad's an anadromous fish. So it actually yep. like in the spring is a, a, the peak season. In fact, right now on the Connecticut River is a, a huge, there used to be a, a shad festival. Um, mm -hmm. So great, great flavored row. Okay, so here I have the Pollock and I'm gonna do the same thing I did last time, but I'm gonna be a little faster and maybe a little sloppier with the uh, uh, filleting because I want to show you what it's like to have a I uh, actually think sometimes I do a better job when I go faster. Not funny. Okay, so there I have Pollock filet and I'll show you uh, if I don't remember to show you how to skin that remind me. Um, and one more on this side real quick. Okay, I'm getting that last little bit off. Oops, you didn't see that. <clears throat> okay, so now, this is an example here of where I took a little bit more of the belly. Okay, but I do have to go through that now and find the, the bones right here. So last time we did the J cut on the redfish, this one is like taking the whole filet with the belly and the bones. And then I have to sort of go through and cut out the bones around the belly and these, this medial line of bones right there. Okay, so what I wanted to show you here was um, that while a lot of this is gonna go into stock, um, I can, I do have the option of harvesting, you know, I'd find a use for that cleaver, the head and the collar. So I took one of the pieces of the collar here on a larger fish, and we don't have as many larger fish as we used to, but you can use a cleaver, you can use a knife, scissors. Oh, I'll show you the Joyce Chins. Those things are amazing. Just go in there, don't cut your fingers. And there I've harvested the collar. So again, this is a smallish uh, pollock, but uh, this is perfectly good meat and it can be braised. We like to lacquer it. You can use like soy and miso and take it down that, that Asian direction. Um, or you can uh, do something more Mediterranean with it. We've even pickled them. So there's lots of really cool uh, uses for uh, the collar. And then if you want to go in, here's the other collar wing, I guess we could call it. You can, you can bread and fry them, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, you can. You just have to be a little bit careful. And again, this depends on how much you've left on. Like I would probably trim these fins off. Um, and then you just have like that one bone right here. But you can eat it like barbecue, absolutely call us. It's, it's great fried like nuggets. Just as long as everyone is eating it knows that it comes with that little collar. Or you can cut around it and make it boneless. But I'm thinking most home cooks aren't going to be down with that. All right, so I wanted to talk about skin. And let me just dump some of these things in my stock pot here. Evan, while you're at it, are there any parts of the fish you would not put into a stock? Yeah, well, when we first harvested uh, the guts, I, you know, it depends on how uh, true to Yankee tradition you want to be, um, because there are definitely organs that are edible. And um, I think for the purposes of talking today to home cooks, you know, a liver of a fish can be used a lot of different ways. Um, sounds can be used, but it's not, those aren't things that like have a reference in our modern diet. So, um, but I, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I think we all know that monkfish liver, for example, uh, is a lot of, lot of fun and versatile to work with. And um, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to field any questions about the organs, but for the most part, I'm going to discard those to make the stock. Specifically, I think you were asking about stock, right, Collis? Yeah, I was. I mean, I typically don't throw in stuff that looks like a spleen or, you know, yeah. the heart or something like that. I think it, it sets the stock off somewhat. And yeah. Absolutely. There's like a sort of uh, bitterness or, um, I don't know, it tastes kind of brown, I guess, is the way I yeah. describe it. Um, so now we have this uh, skin side down. And if you want to make this easy, er, <laughs> you can take your towel and just slip the knife under the edge there so that you can grab. And again, you want that right on the front edge of your board. It's going to make this infinitely easier. And get traction by grabbing it right there. And if you cut through, it's a little bit hard to start again. So you just want to air it on the side of not cutting the skin. So keep that knife parallel to the board. And if you have a larger fillet, it's helpful to have a longer knife. When I'm just getting away with using this one. And there you go. Salmon, I'm sure some of you, I, I saw there are some folks out there from Alaska. Um, I remember the first kitchen I worked in, the chef teaching me how to use your hand just have to separate the skin a little bit and you can actually go through with your hand. Salmon is about the only fish I've ever found that I can do that to. Um, so you can see, now this was the one that had the belly still and some of those bones here. So if you choose that route, you can either use needle nose pliers, uh, but if the flesh of that fish is fragile, as Paula can be a little bit, um, you're just gonna be way better off going in with a knife and following those bones, they contour down a little bit like that. And taking the bones out, they end right about there. And that'll go in the stock as well. So now when I'm going to portion this fish, uh, for the restaurant anyway, um, I would use the very tail piece in chowder or, or sauce or stew. Um, we would then use this tail piece and then this is sort of the sweet meat, the thing that consumers get so excited about is a nice thick loin, um, which I could get two portions out of that because it's thicker. And then we have this little belly piece that I was talking about. And that is serviceable as a filet as well. Or you can again, chop that up and add it to the tail piece and use that in stews and soups and whatnot. Okay, I didn't break down the haddock, but it's just like Pollock. And if anyone wants me to do that, I'd be happy to. I did want to show people, um, I take my gloves off here and go over to the stove. Um, earlier today, I uh, took one of the redfish and I encased it in salt. So uh, fish encrusted in salt is a tradition from Spain, the Iberian Peninsula. and um, it takes a lot of salt to do it, but the reward is that you get this really succulent, uh, moist, 
and redfish really lends itself well to that. I think if, I don't know if Giselle, you want to um, weigh in on where we are time-wise, but I'd very much like to answer questions if anyone has them. Yeah, we've yeah, got a couple of questions. Yeah, that's great. Um, thank you, Evan, for that. And I will throw a couple of these questions your way and then let Carlos pick it up to maybe get into some more detail. Um, the question is if you could go through some ways to cut around the ribs. I seem to always make a mess around the ribs. Maybe you can touch on that for us. Yeah, I was trying to uh, evoke the, the importance of that because I, I too have made that mistake and, um, and continue to after years and years of doing this. But uh, as I just showed you, you can cut around them on the filet that I, as I just did so that if you miss them when you're doing the, the initial cutting of the filet from the fish, uh, that secondary sort of once over allows you the option to cut around those bones or, or pull them out. Um, I, I hope that unless you were talking about like specifically with the whole fish when you do that first cut, knowing when you get to that middle bone where the ribs are and letting the knife follow the contour of those ribs up, that is um, something I, I was hoping that I communicated, but if you want me to do another one, I'd, I'd be happy to. I think, I mean, the one thing I, I might suggest to that is like the, the way I've, you know, I've felt about it is, is you're peeling that fillet back. Um, if you're, you're peeling that fillet back and you're just sort of keeping the knife along the edge of where you're peeling it back, that seems to keep it as close to the ribs as possible. And it just as long as you're taking your time with it, you know, you'll get it as, as good as you can. And it's one of the reasons, Collis, why I'm sort of torn with people who are just starting um, when I talk about the flexibility of a blade. But um, a lot of fish cutters are going to want a blade that's got a little flex to it like that. Um, whereas the one that I was using is stiffer. It's not, you know, very stiff, but it's, it's somewhat mm. more stiff. And so the stiff knife is going to, in some ways, um, be more helpful to the beginner but it will also cut right through those ribs, especially if it's super sharp. Right. You know, another question we've gotten is about the stock. Can you sort of give an idea about how you oh, set yeah. up the stock of seasoning? So one, yeah, one of the things um, in the, that I say in the book that I wrote, there's a whole section, section on building blocks. Um, and I, I firmly believe that all of us who are locked down wherever we are right now are going to be wise just at, like the sourdough craze is happening, there should be a stock craze happening too, because um, that is to me the most elemental building block in all of cooking. If you have a uh, stock in the freezer, um, you can pull it out, thaw it, and use that to make amazing, I mean, it's really the difference between a good soup and a great soup or a great sauce um, or a stew. So, so much cooking that we do at Black Trumpet depends on the quality of the stocks that we work with. And we make five or six different kinds of stocks here, depending on, on what animals uh, we're working with and or vegetables and seafood. So um, for our stock that is like a, a 101 in fish stock, I like uh, to have celery, carrots, um, not always carrots. In fact, we usually don't use carrots now that I think about it. Um, we use celery, onions, leek tops, uh, we'll sometimes go into a stock fennel tops because we work a lot with fennel and there's a sort of classic French fume tradition of using anise flavor with fish and making that initial stock with the fennel fronds. Um, fennel fronds have other great secondary uses too, but a lot of people just throw them out. So, you know, my recommendation is if you ever have any of those things that I'm talking about, like scraps of um, you know, onion skins or celery tops, celery hearts, leek tops, fennel fronds, all of those things can actually go in Ziploc bags and throw them in your freezer until you're ready. And then when the fish is available, you break down that fish and you, you have your, your racks left over. Um, you just throw them in a pot, little white wine, any aromatics that you want other than the fennel fronds, which could involve peppercorns. We usually put some bay leaves in there. And then the rest is water just to cover. I think um, a lot of cooks, even professional cooks, make the mistake of 
filling a stock pot all the way to the top, even if there's a, it's only like a quarter full of bones. And that's fine if you're trying not to burn the restaurant down overnight and it's an overnight stock. But for people at home and you're cooking this for two, three hours, which is probably pretty standard um, for most stocks. And it's different from vegetable to fish to meat. But while we're talking about fish, anywhere from an hour and a half to three hours at the right low temperature simmer is going to build all the flavor you need in that stock. Anything more than that um, is usually not going to affect the flavor of the finished stock. Whew, I didn't pause much there. Yeah. Thanks, Devin. And I think this is a really important um, recognition of not only the nose to tail concept, but just linking this zero waste practice into all of your kitchen, like the way you're linking your off your vegetable scraps with your fish scraps. And you know, it's all about timing. Long ago, I started putting vegetable scraps in my freezer to make stock. And it's the greatest habit I have in the kitchen, I think, because I always yeah. have what it takes. And then if I have fish or bones of any sort, I can mix the two. So I think there's an important part of nose to tail. And I agree completely with your um, comment on the importance of a good stock. Um, I, I saw that Collis put the um, link for your cookbook in here. So I'm going to, I'm going to assume or guess that you might have some tips on stock in that book as well. If somebody wants to go a little deeper on that. Thanks for that. It's a great. Um, There's another question about what to look for. You talked a little bit about the fish knife, one of them that's either, you know, it's either more firm or one that's flexible. I've got one that's flexible, but it, you know, it's a question like what should people look for in a fish knife, say if they're starting out or if they're, you know, more into it. Mm -hmm. um, at risk of making a cultural generalization here, I feel like, um, it's a wise move to go with a Japanese knife um, over a German blade. And it's for a couple of reasons. One, yes, the Japanese sure know what they're doing when it comes to working with seafood. Um, not that the Germans don't eat any seafood, but um, the knives that are made in Germany have a tendency to be very rigid, uh, a little bit thicker. They, they can hold an edge sometimes longer. But, you know, I'm, I'm no knife expert by any means, but I do really like what a Japanese blade um, does in filleting fish. And I also like carbon steel blades. That's a personal fetish and that doesn't have to be shared by, by others. <laughs> and I want to mention that we're going to follow up with all of you who are registered for this session with a recording to this, but also we'll send a link to Evan's cookbook and maybe we'll I'll ask Evan to point out the both the scissors, which I found online, and um, a couple of knives that he recommends if you want to build up your kitchen toolkit. And the scaler. And the scaler, yeah. I totally want one of those and the scissors now. <laughs> so we'll follow up in an email with all of you so you can have links to all of that and maybe um, equip yourself for good fish prep. Thank you for that. I want to call out one quick question that's in the chat, which is what kind of salt do you like to use? Depending on uh, where it's applied during the preparation of the dish, um, I would either use kosher salt for um, adding in the beginning, middle, um, and then at the end, if you're looking to get a finishing texture from salt with a nice clean flavor, then I would use a sea salt. Um, with fish, sometimes it's fun to experiment with some of the you know, Himalayan salts. Uh, some of the smoked salts are really good with certain fish, so mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think you can, you know, work with a lot of different salts. And, you know, I think people just need to not be afraid of playing with that. One thing I will say is that, you know, the larger grain salts don't have the same salinity uh, per teaspoon. So if you're following a recipe that calls for kosher salt, it's not a direct substitution of sea salt. And, you know, cor the coarser salts don't correlate with iodized salt that hopefully not too many of us cook with anymore. And which one of those did you use for the redfish? And, and which would you use for the roe? Uh, I would use kosher for both of those. Perfect. Yep. Excellent. So one more. Um, maybe I'm going to call us, have you ask this question about common fish types to elaborate on a little bit. Anuka is asking, what, what most common fish types follow the butchering principles you demonstrated. So are there any, I think maybe I'll reformat that and call us, you can chime in. Is there, are there any fish 
types of fish or species of fish that you would do in a very different way than what you just demonstrated? Or does one of those techniques generally apply to what you use? Yeah, we, we really looked at, at fish from the Gulf of Maine today, but you know, if I'm gonna get uh, sable from Alaska or which, which sadly, because of my commitment to our local fisheries, I don't get to play with some of those more delicious uh, quote unquote exotic fish. Um, but you know, that lends itself to different preparations as does salmon, um, certainly and tuna and some of those larger predatory fishes. Um, we do work with a great bluefin fisherman, um, yellowfin, also in the Gulf of Maine, all the further out, but there are, uh, you know, there is more variety, halibut certainly, and I would treat some of those differently just based on how much, um, like the thickness of the filet, how much fat is in them, you know, the fattiness of a fish really can be a determining factor. And also, you know, ceviche, we didn't talk much about like tartare, crudo, and ceviche, that process um, requires that the fish that you're catching and then serving uh, be appropriate for basically sushi grade or sashimi grade. And um, with Gulf of Maine fish, it's not, I've had a few people like try to make ceviche out of uh, some of the fish that we have just uh, demonstrated here today. And I, it's, it's a bit of a tough road to hoe. I, I don't personally like um, making ceviche out of redfish. I, I have had it. I'm just not wild about it. And uh, there are other other fish that, because of parasitism, um, I, I get a little nervous about using them for raw preparations. Yeah, I mean, and that you know, it depends on the different species too. Plus, it, if, if any of those fish that you're trying to do for ceviche or anything, if it's not properly bled on the boat, then right. you don't want any part of it. Um, right. But also, different species that we deal with on this side, whether it's like monkfish, you're going to approach it a little bit differently. How you or dogfish, right. which looks like a little shark, that's a different for a, a, a different approach to how you want to butcher that fish. Mm -hmm. As with any flatfish, you still or skate wing, for example. That's a I've done that, and that's a monster. Uh, trying to get the skin off of that, but boy, is it delicious once you've done it. So it really does de depend on the type of fish. But most of the fish that Evan was talking about, fish that are swimming upright that aren't flat, you can at least get started that way and just work your way around the bones. Some of them, like I said, the dogfish is going to have a complete. It has a different bone structure. And you'll it's it got more you'll have to do more to to work around that, but for the most part, these kinds of fish that look like the the pollock, the haddock, the Acadian redfish, any rockfish, rock bass, that kind of thing, um, black sea bass, all of that you can do pretty much the same way that Evan demonstrated. And for people who are stuck at home and they have a grill, like most Americans, um, you know, a lot of the fish that we've just looked at today are. Um, usable on the grill and sometimes that just requires vigilance when it comes to uh, temperature and how much oil you have um, and there are also ways that you can get those whole fish crispy in a pan by applying a slurry of um, well you can do it a couple different ways by like breading it or, or pan frying it with a dredge um, but sometimes just you know, a fairly simple cornstarch slurry brushed onto the, the surface of the fish before it gets a high temperature pan fry can make it really, really delicious in, in texture. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love a Canadian redfish hole on the grill. Just crosshatch the skin, like you said, stuff some, some dill and lemon, salt, pepper, smoked salt, whole peppercorns, throw that on the grill, it's, it'll dr drizzle it in olive oil. It's great like that and it's using the whole fish and it's great it's kind of fun you you know take it right off right off of the carcass so you eat it that way we're all coming over to your house when quarantine's over cause you got to bring the fish because i don't have it <laughs> excellent and one last question um i guess on i'm gonna convert this question and just to i think that a thread in our past culinary slow food live sessions is 
to kind of give it a shot, make mistakes, trust your instincts, it's like taste as you go as far as preparing it. You know, and a couple of things you said, Evan, kind of suggest the same, like the ribs, you got to feel it out. You're probably not going to get it right the first time. Right. And I'm, you know, would you agree with that approach? And do you encourage people just like try it? You're going to eat it either way. Yeah, if we're going to overcome the, the fear of whole fish or, you know, other less processed foods coming into our, into our houses, then um, you're going to have to make mistakes. We all have to, I've, I've made countless mistakes. I have some scars to show. Um, I'll spare you that right now though. But anyway, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's the only way to learn. Perfect. Well, call us or Evan, unless you want to add anything else to this, I want to honor your time and we're getting close to the hour. So we'll wrap it up here. I want to mention that on June 5th, slow, the Slow Fish North America working group is very active and, um, awesome in every way, has been hosting monthly webinars as a deeper discussion into the seafood industry and the players therein and sort of what's important right now and in general. And the next webinar is coming up on June 5th. I will include that link um, and a mention of that in the email that I mentioned earlier so you can join that conversation if you are in the seafood industry or you want to learn a lot more. Those are formatted a little more as a discussion, a panel, a conversation, a little longer. Um, and otherwise, stay tuned for Slow Food Live to see what's coming up next. I hope we have more seafood programming. Maybe we'll get Evan back someday. And um, other than that, thank you for joining. Keep an eye out for that email to come in the next few days. We'll include a link to this session recorded. So if you need to reference back and see something that Evan did during the session, you can do that. We'll make sure that gets to you. Um, I'm going to hand this over to you. And, um, Evan and Collis to wrap it up, but thank you so much for being with us here today. I know that I learned a lot. I'm excited to put my great fish knife, which I do have, to good use. <laughs> Felt a little bit like I lacked the skill to use it in the way it is intended, so now I'm ready. Um, thanks so much for being here today. We really appreciate you, and if you guys are in the Portsmouth area, order a meal from Black Trumpet. Um, I was really hoping to get to have a meal there in March, but of course our event was not able to happen. So next year, I'll see you there, Evan. Thank you guys so much for being here today, Evan and Collis. I'll hand so it over to you to say goodbye or wrap up however you please, and um, everybody out there, take care. Thank you so much for, for hosting, and uh, Collis, thanks for your constant uh, reminder of how important it is to know your fishermen and know your fish. Yeah, thanks a lot, Evan. You know, you want to talk about essential. There, You see your essential worker right there, you know, um, 12 hours in the kitchen, just trying to plan meals that people are, are using, um, trying to keep a vibrant industry. I will say that Evan was one of a, two, maybe three chefs that really brought the, the restaurant scene in Portsmouth to what it is now. And it's because of his dedication to sourcing, uh, to quality, uh, to, to finding local. Um, and so that's what we're really trying to do here is to make sure that, you know, people get to know their fishermen, as Evan said, know the source of their food, know the, sto the story of the seafood um, that they're, they're eating. And yeah, don't be afraid of the whole fish. You can, you can do the whole thing, waste not, use it all. So thanks for joining us. Amen. Thank you all. Take care.